Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess, and I have a return guest today, Dr. Sean Baker, who, since I last spoke, by the way, has broken numerous world records, like you do, right? And we'll talk about that a bit. And has been getting a little bit of momentum, in fact, a lot of momentum, in a movement where, uh, basically, was something we're going to talk about today. Um, so I'm really, really happy to have him back and um, looking forward to this chat. So, Sean, welcome back, mate. Hey, Paul. Thanks. Glad to be back. Um, just tell us briefly, I know you, you were on quite recently, a few, a few months back, tell us about some of the world records you've been still chasing and, and, and beating on the, uh, on the old Concept 2. Yeah, so I think when I when I last spoke with you, I think around early February, I had just broken the 500-meter uh, world record for the 50-plus class at about a time of 1 minute and 17 seconds. Since that time, I've rebroken that record about 10 more times, and now I have it down to about 114.5, which is actually officially faster than the 40-plus the world record. So I'm 10 years, 10 years ahead of the, you know, ahead of the curve. The curve. That so I'm not far from the 20 year 20 year world record as well. I've broken the 100 meter world record, which was 13.6. My best previous had been 13.8, and I pulled that down to a 13.4. Uh, so and then also I think I've broken the one minute for distance record, which used to be the world record was listed at 401 401 meters, and I moved that out to 415 meters. So I've, I've made pretty significant uh, progress, you know, on all these world records and, and even my own in the last, you know, five or six months. And interestingly, okay, so just if people didn't hear, if they didn't hear the last one, 50, 50 years old now, um, right. yeah. still still able to dunk a basketball. I know you're six foot five, I think, six foot five. Yeah. That's, um, a help. that's a help, that's a That's a help, right? But still, it's a long way to get up there. 10 foot is the is the bar, right? 10 foot is the, is the basket. Um, yeah. And breaking world records, and still working as a surgeon, t- taking people apart and putting them back together again, and you know, pretty, pretty interesting all-round suit man for now. But the 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 last year or the last sort of six months where you've been breaking these records, I know you've been running this uh, carnivorous-only diet. Okay, so and we're going to come to that properly. But do you think your your times have improved? more because you've focused on trying to improve your times and you've got in and gone, right, I'm going to do these and I'm going to improve in them on a gradual basis? Or do you think that's come about as part of the change of your diet? Well, I haven't really changed the way I train to, to, to break the record. So I, I put, I've applied basically the same training template, you know, because that's what's worked for me before. That got me from where I was before, so where I could originally break the world record. So I haven't really trained changed that at all. Uh, the diet, I mean... It's kind of interesting because I've noticed other other gains in strength just based on you know things that I really weren't wasn't trying. Like so I'll use a dead, deadlift as an example. Before say in January, a 500 pound deadlift I could do for about two reps, you know, and then it would be a bit of a struggle. I started the diet and without really focusing on deadlifts, that then it went up to eight reps. So that's a that's a pretty big jump, you know, going from two reps to eight reps to 500 pounds. Um, that's without a belt, and you know, and, and so so it's a decent deadlift. So. I have to think that some of that has to do with diet. I, I really do. I think there's a, there's a pretty big impact on that. I mean, certainly, uh, you get some momentum and, and, and sort of as you start breaking records, you, you just kind of keep wanting to push harder and harder. And so I think there's a combination of that. But I think the diet is is, is, a, is pretty big because I, I've trained a long time my whole life and I haven't experienced that sort of boost and that sort of that sort of period of time like, like I have now. Okay, so tell us then remind people about the diet because this is what we're going to really discuss today and and how we want to actually get some other people involved so tell us give it give us the uh the 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 run about what you're eating and why you chose it right so people typically call this a zero carb diet and that's actually a misnomer because you actually do take a little bit of carbohydrate in but it all comes in the form of animal derived products and so most of my diet is just plain, you know, cuts of meat. Usually, it's ribeye steaks and hamburger. That's about 90% what I eat. I'll eat a little bit of sea fi- uh, seafood, some fish, maybe some shrimp, a little bit of dairy, and a little bit of eggs. And that's pretty much the basis of the diet. You know, you can eat, you know, chicken, pork, lamb, you know, whatever animal you you, you like to eat. But I think the most most people find either beef and then sometimes lamb tends to be the most 
uh, most nutritious. And so that's that's basically it. That's all the whole diet. There's there's nothing more than that. And some people look at that and say immediately off the top of the head, they'll say, well, it's nutrient deficient. You're not getting your antioxidants. You're not getting any sort of um, energy source from carbohydrate. You know, how can you be so uh, kind of sure that the, the quality of the meat is is good enough? You're putting all this in you. There's these scares about cancer and all this sort of stuff going on, right? And you're going to find some people that just buy into it and say, right, let's give it a go. And your Twitter account has grown exponentially over the last six months. And there's a lot of people following you, even if they're not engaging, and say and, and want to see what happens with this kind of you know very plain and simple approach with the what's been interesting to me watching you and um you know having brief talks with you and seeing what's going on is that you're like you say breaking these world records your strength's going up um there's been no detriment to your health from your perspective um and then so many people are now asking you right what do I do about this? What if that happens? When I, a classic one is when I get constipated if there's no fiber, right? I mean, I've seen you answer that question multiple times on, on Twitter, right? Um, and, and I can understand why people would ask it and so on and so forth. So right now, what are the most common concerns people are coming to you with, with this sort of approach to, to diet? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, there's a couple of things. Obviously, there's people that you know that, that have this sort of ethical bent that they feel that eating animals is uh, yeah. is ethically inappropriate or, or the same thing for the environment. I think you know you can you can make those arguments, and I think you can dismiss those arguments. A lot of people are concerned about a lack of fiber in your diet, and like you talked about, is going to if there's going to be something wrong with my bowels. There's a lot of people that are concerned about you know nutrient deficiencies because we know that the RDA says you need to get X amount of things like vitamin C and some other things in your diet and at least on its surface, meat doesn't appear to have those things. Um, you know, then there's people that worry about the long-term effects based on some of the epidemiologic data that's out there. Like, is it going to shorten my life? Is it going to cause cancer? Is it going to cause heart disease? And so, I think there's good answers for all those things. Um, I think some people sort of vicariously watch Twitter to see if I'm either going to keel over of a heart attack or if I'm just going to keep getting better and better. So we don't know where this is going to go. At the same time, lots and lots of people are starting to adopt this. And you, you're as witness just as much as I am. Most of those people are saying, wow, I'm feeling better. And it's pretty exciting. And there's already established social media groups like Facebook zeroing in, zeroing in on health and zero carb health and something called Principia Carnivore. That, that have, they have 10, 15,000, 20, 20, in together they have about 25,000 members. And all those people are saying the same thing, basically. You know, the vast majority. There's some that are having trouble, but most of them are saying, my joints stopped hurting, my gastrointestinal problems went away, my mental health got better, my body consciousness got better, I feel better. So it's hard to, hard to sort of dismiss all that, you know, even though it's all a bunch of anecdotes. And, and that's what people say, well, it's just an anecdote. But when you start seeing this over and over and over and over again, you have to, if you're, if you're at least fair, you have to say, wait a minute, maybe there's something there. Maybe we should look at this a little more closely. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can certainly talk about why I think those concerns are not valid or at least need to be questioned if we want to go into detail about that. But those yeah, are things that... Let, let's do that. Let's do that. Because I think a lot of people are feeling better especially if they're coming off of a standard American diet because they're taking out a lot of the things that are causing them problems and gut inflammation and, you know, irritants and all sorts of nonsense that they're calling food out there. They're, they're, you know, they're taking that out and going into just eating meat and, I don't know, uh, eggs or shrimp or whatever it is. And that in itself is taking away a lot of those, you know, the grains and the lectins and everything else that's causing them those problems. So they're, they're going to feel better. I'm really interested to see if long, long term, the the improvements continue, which I know you're very interested in as well. But, but yeah, let's address some of those those concerns that uh, that we that you spoke about, and um, you know, cover them one by one if you can. Yeah, so I mean, I think the, you know the one, the, the issue with you know you need fiber for a healthy bowel function, and so what we do know is that. Insoluble fiber, cellulose. We just humans, or really no mammals, have the capacity to actually digest, and so it, goes, it passes through us largely indigested. 
there is a there is a gut microbiome that has to sort of uh, sort of uh, evolve in your digestive tract to allow you to do that. And so you can incompletely digest some of those plant materials, derive some short chain, chain fatty acids from that, a few other nutrients, and that's how humans have a little bit of that capacity. Our, our capacity to do that pales in comparison to most other animals that, that spend a lot of time grazing. Grazing, we're about equivalent to what cats and uh, dogs can do based on hardware, being being the anatomy that we have for, for fermentation capacity, much reduced from primates. And so that material that gets passed through us, you know, comes out as you, know, you have these big, large bowel movements, you know, multiple times a day often. And that's what people are kind of used to because we've been eating grains and stuff like that for, you know, 10,000 years or so. So that's what's considered normal. So when you don't do that anymore, what you see is because we know that meat is really well digested. I mean, the hydrochloric acid in our stomach, which is extremely strong, you know, it's a pH of about 1.5, which is on par with other carnivores and scavengers. And so we are able to, to very completely digest that meat and it's absorbed in our small intestine. By the time it gets to our colon, there's it's, there's a little bit of liquid and that's about it. So that's why you don't have very many bowel movements. You did just the volume goes down and the frequency goes down. So it's not that you're you're blocked up. It's just that you're not making as much. You're absorbing everything. So all that nutrition that you're taking in is going to where it, where it needs to be rather than sitting in your colon and, and just kind of sitting there and waiting for you to pass it out. So that's I think one you know, one sort of concern that I think is not really really valid. And and, and, can I, and I just want to make a point as well that, that you know the standard thought by a lot of people is if you are constipated then you need to you need to take in more fiber. The actual mechanics behind that means that if you take in more fiber when you are constipated you're probably going to make it worse. Because if I mean it's very much like say you've got a, a hose pipe with a lot of dry hay in there. To, to get it moving, you don't stick more hay in, you put more water through it to try and soften it up and move it. And and the the misconception is that you, you do need more fibre for it to move. And I see it in a lot of clients where they'll they come to me that that very issue. What I'm very interested in, in coming back to as well, actually, is your hydrochloric acid comment that you made. I do find that a lot of people that are coming off of a poor diet or a highly stressed and you know a few other issues going on that they do tend to have low stomach acid so and i know this is an aside but if people are thinking about going on to this approach would you suggest any sort of um hydrochloric acid hcl supplementation to start with just to make sure that they're covering all the bases or would you just say look just go with it and your body will produce its own as it needs to well, I think you know if you if you know if you've been on these proton pump inhibitors and you and you and, or if you've got a known problem with that, that probably is a reasonable place to, to, to start with. I think given time, you know maybe it's a few weeks that, that you probably can probably do away with those things. I think most people probably have the capacity to do that, but there are some people. Yeah, there's definitely people that have sort of had such a bad diet that their that their their entire GI system doesn't work as it's designed, and so it might take some time to uh, uh, reestablish that. You know what should be normal, at least from a from an evolutionary standpoint. So yeah, I think that's not unreasonable. Okay, and then um, so the next point was uh, let's say vitamin C, for example. Yeah, so vitamin C, you know that, that's that's a big one because you know you, if you if you if you go online and you and you Google nutrition pound in in, in hamburger or steak, you're going to see vitamin C and it's listed as zero. Uh, there's some there's some evidence to indicate that there's actually some in there. However, it's still not a large amount. But what we do know, uh, well, historically we know that that you know if you look back just a hundred years, people knew that you could cure vitamin C or, or cure scurvy or prevent scurvy by by feeding people raw, you know, uh, fresh meat basically. The other thing that we're starting to find out, at least now with the bio, from the biochemistry standpoint, is that if you're not ingesting a lot of carbohydrates. Glucose competes with vitamin C, and so when you're not taking in a lot of glucose, you, your your requirement, your absolute requirement for vitamin C, actually goes down. And there's even some thought that humans have substituted a little bit of uric acid as a substitute for vitamin C, and, and it can act in its in its, in its role, a serving serving a similar function. So, and I think that's the case with a number of other vitamins and minerals that, that if we don't require a big carbohydrate-based metabolism, those things all change. And that's where the RDA doesn't reflect those things, or what's now called the dietary reference indexes. Yeah. And even if you look 
on the people that, that comment on those those uh, you know RDAs as they were established, they say it's very weak evidence, and it's based just on expert opinion. So we don't have any RCTs to really validate what those RDA requirements actually are. So it's it's kind I'm, of interesting. I'm we're, we're also in a situation now. Yeah, lose your Paul. Yep. No. So we're we're also in a situation now where we we're, we're realizing more and more that everyone's individual. So if if one person needs, I don't know, 60 milligram of vitamin C a day, then that's great. But someone else might only need four milligram or 400 milligram. Everybody has a very individual gut biome and a very individual need for everything. So taking in these RDAs, which are the minimum requirements to prevent scurvy, whatever it is, uh, you know, it, it's quite a an arbitrary number now. And I think more and more people are getting involved with their own personal nutrition in a way that suits them rather than something that's written down in a book that says, yeah, this is how much you should have. Yeah, I think it's just like the, the dietary guidelines, you know, I mean, those are those are population guidelines. They're not individual. And I think the problem is when you when you take a, a you know, an 80 year old woman and, and tell her she needs to eat the same as a three year old child or an 18 year old athletic male, it's just not going to work. So yeah. that's that's one of the problems we have with those numbers. OK, so talk of numbers. The good thing about it is you don't need to measure your, you don't weigh and measure your food, right? And well, I'm, yep. And and it also happens that you eat a fair amount. I mean, I know you're a big lad, but that you you get through some big numbers in the day when it comes to not only volume of food, but also volume of protein. So yes. give us a, give us a background as to how much that is. Yeah. So for me, I mean, it's, you know, I, you know, and again, I'm not counting these things or counting macros or anything like that as I, and I would argue no other animal on the planet does that either. But, uh, right. you know, I, I typically will eat about four pounds of meat a day. And that's, you know, if you look at it from a caloric standpoint, it's, you know, 4,500, maybe, maybe 5,000 calories, depending on how fatty it is. And then protein is, you know, probably somewhere in the 375 to 450 grams of protein a day, which which for me, you know, if, if I look at my lean body mass, I'm about 240 pounds relatively lean. So I've probably got about 215 pounds of lean body mass. So that's, on some days I approach two grams per pound, which is well above what, you know, most people would say is necessary or ideal. And so, yeah, definitely it's, it's, a, it's a relatively uh, higher than what would normally be recommended protein diet for sure. And then obviously the next question is, well, we can only digest 30 grams of protein at a time. So that's ridiculous. And, and I don't believe that, but I'm just saying this is what people say. Right. Where, well, where, I mean, I, th I think there's some recent studies that come out, Paul, that have shown that, that that's not the case. Yeah, that's not the case. Yeah. We know that we can adjust more. And if you, I mean, again, I can just, I just put these analogies out there. If you look at like a lion, you know, it's a big animal, it weighs, you know, three, 300, 400 pounds, you know, 150 kilos or whatever. And it, it eats big boluses of meat. I mean, it, it has a capacity. And we still, I think, have that capacity to, to, to take that in, to utilize it as much as we need. And the reason we're hungry, you know, if you're if that's your diet, and that's the only thing a lion eats, it eats a bunch, and then it doesn't eat for a day or two because it's not hungry, and then it eats a bunch again. And that's, that's what he has, has the ability to do. And I think our hunger signals are there for a reason. So I eat till I'm full. I don't eat again maybe for 16, 18 hours sometimes if I'm not full and I eat again until I'm full. And I, and I can't believe that we, we, we're not designed to be able to do that. It doesn't make sense. It's not that we have to set a stopwatch and say, okay, it's two hours, I got to eat again. Because that's, it just doesn't work that way in any other species. No, I agree. And also, I think evolutionary-wise, we were built to, like, and you know, a lot of people are saying this now, and Rob Wolf especially has, has commented on it many times, you know, we're, we're built to eat a lot and not move very much. And when you, if you're going to use a, a lion analogy, that's kind of what they do. They eat a lot and then lay down, you know, yeah. a lot until they're hungry and then they go again. And the other thing with this sort of approach, if you're going to have a, a like, for example, you know, a zero carb diet, let's say, and you're going to be eating a lot of uh, red meat and uh, fats via animals and so on, is it is very self-limiting from a hunger point of view. Because... You, you tend not to want to overeat masses of steak and it tends not to make you hungry because it doesn't vary your blood sugar so much. It doesn't drop it you know, with huge amounts of insulin spikes and so on and so forth. So it tends to be quite self-limiting, which is one of the massive problems that people have when they're trying to follow a diet of some kind. 
Yeah, I don't. I mean, it is rare that, you know, when I used to think about what hunger was, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're on a carb based diet, when you're hungry, I mean, it's I mean, it's, it's literally a cellular crisis. I mean, your body's saying there's not enough glucose for my cells to run. And it's pretty uncomfortable. You know, you, we, you know, I know Ted named that diagram this calls it hangry. But, yeah. you know, you've got this sort of sensation that I have to eat or I'm going to or something's going to happen. I never have that anymore. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm kind of like, OK, I probably need to eat now just because I'm out of, out of a little bit of habit now. But when I, you know, when I start cooking the steak and I can smell it and I will sal- you know, sort of salivate a little bit. You know, it's kind of like I'm like a dog salivating yeah, away from yeah. my dish. But I mean, that's it. That's that's the only sort of sense of hunger I have at this point. I mean, maybe if I didn't eat, maybe if I intentionally fasted for two or three days, it would be a little different. But right now, I mean, those sort of two feeding periods that I have, you know, 90 percent of the time, it's just like, yeah, maybe a tiny bit time to eat. And then, and then but there's no this pressing desire that I have to eat to regulate my blood glucose because I think it's pretty steady. There's been some diabetics out there, very interestingly, that are, that are doing on this carnivore diet and they're checking their blood sugars and they're seeing just remarkably mm-hmm. steady relatively low blood sugars despite eating 150 200 grams of protein in one bolus which yeah. is i think i think puts a little question mark on all the people that says you know it's going to drive this rampant crazy gluconeogenesis and all that stuff so so yeah i think that's uh that's, that's a big advantage and I, and I think what you say is absolutely right the keto you know fraternity who would be following this are going to say yep you can't eat that much protein because it's going to ramp up your blood glucose levels by breaking down all your muscle protein and therefore it's going to send you out of ketosis and so on and so forth. And it kind of is proving that not to be the case, certainly in not everybody. And I think, sure. again, you know, everybody processes things differently, but potentially when you are just eating one food type on a consistent basis, your body's going to adapt in some way, whether it's just a, a really good short-term uh benefit or whether it's going to last longer we're yet to find out but right now for you it's working great yeah so eight months in and you know and there and you can you know you can certainly find people that have years and years of this and 10 years and two decades and even a fellow that's 50 years into this stuff uh you know in recent times aside from all the historical stuff but yeah i think one of the problems we have is we learn a little bit of biochemistry and then we, we can extrapolate it to every situation in, in all circumstances and all people. But when you start really testing that clinically, and that's why I'm a big sort of proponent of let's see what actually happens to a human being over the long term and measure what's clinically important rather than let's, let's, rather than let's try to you know, learn a little bit of biochemistry, which we're going to understand only incompletely, and then say that's what works for everybody because it, it, it clearly is shown not to. And, so and, I we're, think, and we're nowhere near understanding the human body. Even though we're oh. so advanced and everything else, yeah, you know, there's even the unknown unknowns, the stuff we don't even know about that we don't know. So, for, for for people to turn around and say, right, this is how the human body works, therefore you should have this, is still naive. You know, yeah, people- I th- you know, I think there's some there's some things we've learned. You know, there's some acute things. You know, like I know if, if somebody comes to me and their hemoglobin is super low i know they're they're low on blood they need some blood likely but yeah. all these other things that are floating around and all the things like the microbiome is just getting a lot of attention right now i mean we know so relatively little about that and just sort of presume that you can sort of make all these proclamations about what's the best diet and you know what you have to do to fix that i think is way premature and i think uh you know a lot of people will criticize a ketogenic diet say it's going to kill your microbiome or, or whatever diet i'm doing it's going to you're, you know you're, you're going to you're going to get all these diseases and stuff and i think that the, the data that supports that is probably not even one tenth of one percent of, of the knowledge that's going to be sort of gained over the next even decade and then they're only going to say wow there's a lot more to it and you know even the, if the human body has billions of processes going on at one time and then you then you then you multiply that by every little different bacteria in your body times 10 billion of them then you're gonna that, that it's really complicated yeah. so i consider it mostly a black box quite honestly i mean it's, it's, it's sort of i don't want to be sort of nihilistic about it but i mean i think you know we know a little bit of what you put in and what comes out at the other end everything in between we know a little tiny bit about it you know what really is going on and we think we can make all these predictions based on it and i think it's just it's just too hard to do. And I think people get wrapped up in that and they, they read hundreds of research studies and they find out there's just so much information out there and a lot of it's conflicting and it's very confusing. So I, I'm just, maybe it's the orthopedic surgeon in me where I hit things with a hammer and I, you know, it's like, <laughs> do this, see what happens and not worrying about the, about all the little details because they change all the time. So yeah, I think totally, that's totally agree. Um, yeah. 
did I, I, I um, spoke to, well, I've got a client, which I know I tried to introduce you to, who is a cattle farmer. Yeah. And, um, and I sent you an email. I don't know if you two actually spoke at some point. But he gave me a really good insight into how they uh, feed and breed the cattle that are grain fed. Right. And, you know, I had a, a question about the hormone intake that they have and, you know, how that affects the meat and, you know, we're taking it in and all this kind of stuff. Because, you know, the, the, the big headlines that we see are, you know, hormones go in, therefore you eat the hormones, therefore it's bad, blah, 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 blah. He had a very interesting educational process to give me because um, the amount that actually goes into a, uh, a cow over its lifetime is very, very little. I mean, just you wouldn't even notice it because it is such a small amount when you look at the, the lifespan of the, of the animal. It's there for a good reason and it has a good effect, but it's nowhere near what people think it is. They're not having, you know, huge amounts of steroids being shoved into them every day and all this kind of stuff. So that was very interesting. I may even get him on, on the show at some point to try and talk about that more. But it definitely opened my mind to, to the fact that it doesn't have to be necessarily organic grass-fed product. You know, otherwise you're going to absolutely ruin yourself because of all these um, toxins you could potentially be taking in. What, what's your view on that? Right. So, I mean, if you, if you just look at the overall food supply in general, you know, every, every crop that's raised is, is, is basically covered with some sort of pesticide. We've got all these things in our food supply. And then you've got some activists that really don't like the fact that we animals are really focusing on that and bring that to public attention. But I mean, in general, you're taking in all these things to some, some small degree anyway. But if you look at it in animals, um, yeah, you look at the amount of actual uh, hormone that comes, you know, estrogen hormone that, that actually shows up in the beef, and it's tiny, tiny, tiny compared to, uh, you know, things like soy, you know, soy products, you have these, all these huge amounts of phytoestrogens you know, on a scale of millions of folds higher. And so it's such a relatively small thing when you compare, you know, it's like looking at relative risk versus a- absolute risk. And you know, the same thing with the omega-3, omega-6 ratio in beef. If you look at the, the relative, uh, you know, changes, it's a little bit more. But when you look at the absolute amount and you compare it to all these other foods, it's minuscule. And so to, to focus on that, I think is a little bit, deceptive and a little bit misguided and I think it hurts a lot of people. You do not have to buy the highest here's a there's a hierarchy I put it in. I think that meat is an excellent source of nutrition. It's far superior probably than any other food out there. And so as long if you focus on that and then you can worry about, you know, if you've got the finances financial resources and stuff like that, then you can start to say, okay, can I afford this little slightly better stuff and maybe it'll give me a one percent benefit. It's like taking somebody who never works out and saying, all I gotta do is take creatine here and it's super strong. You know, that doesn't happen. you got to do all the basic stuff. And so for me, just eating meat is the basics. You know, maybe maybe that little bit of organic might be the creatine on top. But, I mean, it's, it's not that big of a deal. You know, and I think I, to tell people you got to spend a lot of money on that is, 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 is unfair because most people can't afford it. And uh, if you're comparing estrogen, then tap water has probably got more in it than, than any kind of beef you're going to get. Just from the amount of contraceptive pill that gets uh, prescribed and then women you know, urinating in the toilet and then that gets recycled and, and the hormone doesn't get removed out of it effectively and you'll end up with, you know, pretty high levels of estrogen just in the drinking water. So the cow's kind of the last place you want to worry about. The, um, yeah, I mean, sorry, yeah, I mean it's exactly that. I mean, you know, you have to put things in a relative perspective. Mm-hmm. And, you, you know, if you fixate on, you know, 1% difference when you've got a, you know, a million percent difference on the other end, it's, it's just, it's just, it just doesn't make sense. And, and I know that when you're not eating the the steak that you buy, and it, oftentimes you'll clear out a whole supermarket if they've got a special offer on, right? Yeah. But, yeah. And which is one of the reasons I put you in touch with the farmer because he, he could probably supply you half a cow really cheap and, you know, yeah. get you, get it in your freezer and jobs are good. And so if you do get together with him, I'd really be interested to see what happens. But, but then anyway, when you're out on the road, you have got no problem in diving into a, a fast food joint like a McDonald's or Wendy's or whatever it is, and then just getting your, your burger patties on their own out of there. That, yep. that is an unusual experience, not only from the consumer, but from, from the man behind the till point of view. So how do, how do you get around the fact that they look at you like you're a crazy six foot five madman and, uh, and don't really understand how to put that into a till? 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's a funny thing because, you know, first of all, there's a lot of people that criticize me for doing that because they say, how can you support these fast food places? They're horrible. And, and to, to a point, I agree with some of that because a lot of the stuff they market to kids, a lot of what they provide is is really bad for us. You know, the, the, the oils and, the, and, the, and the, the sugar and all that stuff that's in there. But they do have a lot of them, not all of them, but all, most of them have just 100% pure beef. It's not, it's not organic necessarily, although there's some that actually do. But it's, it's, it's straight up beef, and that can be a very nutritious source of food. And so when I go in there, and this is one of the one of the big things that shows me that when we talk about meat eaters, when we when we look at epidemiologic studies, when I walk in there and order, you know, I go in there, I'll say, hey, can you sell me a single burger patty? And they'll say, yeah. I'll say, what's the price? And they'll, if it's a if it's a normal guy, like a, a young a, a, a new employee, they'll they'll scratch their head because they've never done it before. They'll bring the manager in. They'll Go through a couple of screens. I'll figure out how to do that. And I'll say, "What's the price?" Well, they'll say, "You know, it's a dollar twenty-nine for a quarter-pound patty." I said, "Okay, give me ten of those because I want to eat, you know, two and a half pounds of meat in that city. That's that's what I typically do." And then they kind of look a little shocked and they go, "Is that three here?" Because they think, you know, I think I'm you know, supplying a party or something. But yeah, so I'll eat that. And then, um, you know, it's just because they're so shocked by that because that's never ordered what that tells me is everybody that goes into that restaurant is ordering a hamburger with fries with a bun with a coke and that's and when i look around i see all these obese, obese people and that's what they're eating none of them are eating just plain patties by themselves and so but when we do these epidemiology studies the cohort that we're looking at are all these people that are eating all this other stuff in addition to the meat and they just say well that's a meat eater well that's you know, that's something we hope to disprove with, with some of this experimentation stuff we're doing. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that brings us not... Oh, actually, before we go on to the experiment, organ meats, what are your thoughts on that? Yes. Is it a good thing to add in? I think it's a great thing to add in. You know, I, I don't think it's a necessary thing to add in. You know, it's it's they're, they're very nutritious. They're high in nutrients. Uh, you know, depending where you go, I'm, I'm, I'll be in France next week and I'll probably eat some foie gras because... It's pretty available there, and I and I don't mind it. But I don't. I'm not a fan of a lot of the like beef liver and chicken liver. A lot of people love that stuff, yeah. you know, brains and kidneys. That's fine to eat. It's absolutely clear that people have eaten those things for for millennia. I mean, it's you know, and probably back you know twenty thousand years ago when you're hunting around. I mean, you ate everything you possibly could because it's not easy. I don't have to go out and kill a mammoth to get what I eat. So. So, so I can I can be selective. I can eat the stuff I like. Where as back then, you know, you kill that, and if you didn't eat everything you could, you probably starved. And so, and it's hard work taking, you know, killing a big giant animal like that. So now I have the luxury of not eating that, and I haven't noticed any sort of negative health effects. And, and again, I point to just thousands of people that report the same thing. All they eat is ground beef and Wendy's hamburgers, and they're they're thriving. They're happy. They've lost weight. They're lean. They're people that couldn't give birth are now fertile again. There's people that. You know, had joint pain that's gone away, their depression's gone away, and so while well, I think organ meats are fine and good, and if you like them, go ahead and eat, eat, eat them as much as you want. You, know, you might have to temper liver a little bit because you can get vitamin A toxicity if you eat too much of it. And certain animals concentrate stuff a little more. I know that not that any, too many people eat this stuff, but like polar bear liver, you know, eating, eating in that quantity can be a problem. But, but yeah, organ meat is fine. All right, well, so before the show, I ate. Um Two hundred fifty grams of ribeye and two hundred fifty grams of calves liver, just in preparation for you, because I thought <laughs> that would be that would be a, a suitable thing. Um, I've I've yet to find any polar bear liver, but if I find any, I'll make sure I don't eat too much of it. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, so so tell us about the experiment that that now you've decided. You know what? Let's see if this really has a good effect on people because this is really really interesting, and and I'm quite excited to see how this goes. Yeah, so I mean, you know, obviously I get a lot of, you know, there's people that are that are that are, you know, watching me, and some people are inspired by that, and then there's other people who say, well, you're just an N equals one, you exercise really hard, you're an outlier, you know, you know, we don't even believe, maybe, maybe you're just lying, I don't know, but, but my my whole point is, you know, there's other people doing this. The problem is none of that stuff is sort of organized, and so I'm just providing them, you know, I, I just said, well, what happens if everybody tests it and see, because we've got all this stuff that says meeting's going to cause diabetes, you know, there's a film that the vegans, or, or the vegan doctors kind of put out called What the Health, and they said, you know, if you eat meat, you can't have, you, you can't have, you know, you, 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 you can't have an erection, and you're going to get diabetes, and all, and you instantly get fat in your blood, and you're going to get all inflamed, and so if that stuff is really true, it should be dose dependent. And so if I eat a bunch of meat, man, I should be the sickest guy on the planet because I'm eating all this horrible toxic stuff that's gonna give me diabetes and all that stuff. Thus far, it hasn't happened. In fact, the opposite, opposite's happened. So I think if you take people that, a lot of them, you know, right now we've got a little over 200 people signed up, which is pretty cool, I thought, I was more than I thought I'd get. 
uh, that have signed on to this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we're going to record your food because a lot of the other dietary trials in every they, they, they do these food frequency studies or, or surveys where they ask people, what did you eat six months ago? And they try to, you know, they try to guess what they ate. It's really hard to do. We're going to sort of really accurately record what everybody's eating. We're going to ask that everybody eats basically meat, drinks water. Some of them might have a little bit of a few eggs and stuff like that, maybe a little dairy, but that's going to be the bulk of their diet. And then we're just going to, we're going to, we're going to, Test whatever we can test for, whatever we can afford to do. So we know there's some easy, like survey type stuff that we can we can administer that have been validated for research validated that we can put out there. And then we're gonna at the same time we're gonna be sort of launching a fundraising campaign. Now some of these people will be able to fund their own studies. You know, some I have actually a lot of doctors. Believe it or not, I think I've got about ten doctors signed up for this, which is pretty pretty cool. I think. But but then at the same time we'll say, okay, well. We've got 200 people that are going to go meat only. Does it cause diabetes? Well, why don't we test all test everybody's maybe fasting insulin or their fasting or you know uh, their HPA1 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 score or HbA1c and to see and if none of them show up with a high A1c, you got to say, well, how does that mean they get diabetes? You know, the, 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 there's going to be a lot of criticism of this because it's not randomized control. There's not a control group. It's not blinded. But this is a start. This is just saying. Uh, if it can even be done through social media. But I think that's the way research is going to end up going because, you know, it's hard to get funding for this stuff and the funding that is coming is, is, is biased. It's coming from, you know, drug companies that want to make money on a drug or food manufacturers that want to support whatever 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 food they're making. So I think people... Also, are you're going to get... I think you're going to get a, uh, a really good understanding of what happens to a mass cohort that are asked to do a certain thing. So either they're going to fall off it and not finish it properly, which happens in any study. There's always some dropout. Sure. Uh, and then you're going to find that, you know, okay, in this instance, 200 plus people are going to follow that particular protocol. And these are the, this is the meta-analysis of those 200. You know, these are the, the commonalities that we find. I don't know what it's going to be, but let's say, you know, HbA1c was better, fasting insulin was better, ALT in the liver was slightly higher, maybe. I don't know, whatever it is. But it, it gives you a pretty good understanding from a, you know, from a quite a big sample size. And the other thing that is really interesting from my perspective is generally when you look at a, a study, especially if it's a performance study, they'll generally use elite athletes or they'll, they'll use a particular level of person it's very rare that it comes from a wide variety of backgrounds because they they don't tend to one have the money to run a, a big um, sample size and therefore if they reduce the, the the sample size into a certain demographic they're able to control more what the what the results come out of. so it'll be really interesting to see from from that perspective yeah, it's, it's, you know, Matt Mayer is the other guy that's kind of helping, you know, we've kind of come together to create this n equals many dot com sort of thing. And, you know, it's really, this is the first thing we're trying to do. And the first question is, can we even get 200 people to, to even stay together for, for, for 90 days? We don't know if that's even going to be possible. So we'll see. I hope it is. And I hope we can get some data from it. But our first goal is just, can we develop the mechanism to do that? And then if that's successful, let's keep doing it. And maybe we can start doing these intervention type uh, type studies where we can take people that are coming all coming from a standard American diet and all going on a keto diet or all going on a whatever diet and then start looking at those metrics and then if you get big numbers you know if you can if you can get social media buy into this and now all of a sudden you've got a cohort of 10,000 people then you can really sort of move the needle on, on on I think on research and you can do it without having to spend you know because the money's just not there and I think there's enough I think there's enough people that are sick of just not getting better that they're willing to engage in self-experimentation. Yeah. And I think to harness all those people together, you can get these huge, huge numbers. And if you come together and you standardize everything for everybody, I think you can really, you know, learn a lot. And I think we can we can push our understanding of, of uh, nutrition and athletic performance and supplements and all those things. Obviously, we can't do drug trials and stuff like that because there's you know there's all the FDA stuff. But I see this is this is this is just a freedom of speech thing. People getting together, sharing experience, and reporting what they what they found and see what happens. So, well, um, okay, so when when would the uh, the the start date be if someone wants is interested in getting involved? Yeah, so we're going to push. We're, I, you know, my my partner Matt is more the technical guy, and so he's kind of working on developing the. 
you know, the database collection tools. And, and we kind of looked at a target date over the first part of August. We don't have the official date yet. I'm actually going to be traveling. And I won't be, I'll be out of the country until the first of August. So we wanted to do it. I wanted to do it when I got back just so I could kind of make sure I'm there to answer questions and stuff like that. So, uh, so probably about two weeks away, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm getting, you know, a dozen people every single day signing up, you know, the more and more people that hear about it, the more people are, are interested in it. So it's kind of becoming a, a little bit of a, just a, just a logistical work to try to get all those people entered in databases yeah. and stuff like that. But, but that's what's going to, that's what's going to take. And we're getting people, and surprisingly, I've got all these offers for people to help analyze data, put a, put together data collection systems, uh, funding, you know, I've got a gal that's going to help us, you know, run a fundraising campaign for this. Uh, we've got a lot of these researchers that said, hey, use this tool on your cohort because I'd like to see what happens. And so I think there's some there's going to be more and more ex excitement about these types of things where people can say, hey, I can't get this funded through tr traditional sense or th through traditional means, but hey, this might be a place for me to go to, to let's just recruit people and, and, and have them do these things. So, yeah, so we're, early August is when we're hoping to kick this off. There'll be a lot. I'll make some announcements on, you know, Twitter certainly and any other social media stuff I have. Okay, so the website, if people are interested, is n equals many dot com, and they can go there and register. And I'll put that in the show notes. Um, hopefully, people are listening to this before the the August start date, and they can just jump on and, and quickly put their details in if they want to give it a go. I've also watched your video on YouTube, which is you telling people what they have to do, and it's very simply just a carnivorous diet and water no supplements as i understand yeah, unless, it. yeah i mean unless somebody has a medical necessity you know there's people that have had medical conditions that require lifetime supplementation so those people should continue on that we don't want anybody to stop taking medicines yeah. you know this is completely voluntary so you, you know it's you know people are people do what they want to do they can leave come in whatever whatever they want to do with that we're not you know we're not trying to force anybody to do anything but but generally we're trying to eliminate the confounders as much as possible because that's one of the big criticisms i think most of the nutritional research has it's just so confounded with the dietary variables that if we can keep this as clean as possible uh then i think it's going to be a, a more powerful argument uh, whatever the data comes out it may be that meat is absolutely horrible for everybody and everybody got really sick on this or nobody could do it or or maybe we'll get Things to say, hey, everybody, everybody did well. They feel better, and their labs look pretty good based on what we can, what we know about the labs. And so, but but the less confounders we have in there, the, the better we're going to be. Like I said, if my supposition is I won't get scurvy from eating meat, and I'm supplementing vitamin C, it, it's hard to make that argument. Yeah. So, talking of labs, um, I know you you haven't had any bloods done as yet, and you're waiting for kind of the, the 12 month mark to come in and see where they where they sit, which is which is great. I'm really interested for the for the people in the uh, experiment or the research, let's call it. Um, sure. It would be very useful if they had some sort of idea of their bloods before going in. Um, right. So I mean, that would that you know, like I said, and that's certainly something that's going to be criticized because we didn't want to exclude anybody, you know. And some people, we've got people that just just can't afford all the testing, you know. Some of the stuff is so we want to just we want to do it if people are willing to do that ahead of time that's fine we're not going to prevent people from doing that we would like to get everybody on the same page you know via fundraising and say okay now everybody that's in the study we all want you to get your hemoglobin a1c drawn and see what it is and if everybody's comes back 5.1 you know then we can say well you know that's not really consistent with, with a diabetic hemoglobin a1c and so but later on it would be nice to say you know do a true intervention where we get a cohort that has all these markers established at the beginning, and then all these markers established at the end. So, you know, we're gonna we're gonna check, we're gonna track some track some things from the beginning from the end that are free, you know, weight to height ratios and stuff like that, that that don't cost us anything to do. But I mean, from a cost perspective, because one, we didn't know how many people were gonna do it. Two, we don't have any we have no money for it as of yet, and so we can't just say, okay, everybody go out and get five hundred dollars worth of lab tests. Yeah. Because and we don't know if the, the study's even going to going to go forward, so it's hard to do that initially. Now I think subsequently, once we kind of sort of proof of concept concept this stuff, and we get more and more buy-in, then I think we'll have more people that, that will will be able to do that. But at this point right now, if people want to do lab testing ahead of time for their own personal edification and share that later, that's fine. Uh, but we're not requiring that at, at, at this stage. No, and but I agree with what you just say. If you want to get it done, um, just out of blind curiosity of your own 
situation and how things change, then it's uh, it's definitely worth doing because it gives you something to to measure. We're not talking about you know relying on the exact measurements of what you get as being a um, disease marker or anything like that. All we're looking at is what has changed over the the twelve weeks. Is it twelve weeks long the study? So it's going to be 90 days, so three months. So, yeah, it'll be, you know, in fact, I, I, we just said 90 days or three months. Okay. So that's was it, maybe 92 days, depending on the month. So, right. uh, yeah, something in that in that time frame will probably, you know, as we get close to the end and we see how much funding we have, we'll kind of be able to determine what labs we can afford to do on people and, and what they're willing to get. Because we put this out initially as a survey. What do you want to test? And, I mean, we got answers of there. Right? People wanted to do you know, million dollar studies on everybody. And we're like, well, <laughs> that money's got to come from somewhere. So, so we're trying to get, you know, we're, there's some really basic questions we want to answer first. And so we'll, we'll probably have a, we'll have, probably have a hierarchy of, we're going to test this first, you know, and then if we get some more funding, then we can test this. And if we get some more funding, we'll, we'll test this. And that's how it's going to have to work. Brilliant. Okay. So first question, a lot of people will be thinking in their head is, wow, I'd love to do it, but that sounds really expensive buying all that meat. So if someone is, looking to do it but are concerned about maybe the, their own affordability for the food what, sure. what what would be your advice on doing it on the cheap so to speak yeah so i mean and, I, and I've, I've, I've posted on twitter a few times in the u.s there's a similar one in, in the uk but in the u.s there's something called mygrocerydeals.com and i plug that in there i plug my my uh my zip my area my zip code or whatever city I'm in, and it tells me, it goes to the grocery and finds the cheapest cuts of whatever you want. You you can really, I mean, normally ribeye steak in the U.S. runs about eight, nine, ten bucks a pound, twelve dollars a pound, sometimes thirteen dollars a pound. I find this stuff for four four dollars a pound, and so I just go in and load up, buy everyone in the store, you know, and and, and, it, and you can you can find cheaper cut, you know, hamburger, you know, hamburgers or mints, you guys call it mints, yeah. is also very cheap, and so you can certainly do that. You can do chicken, which is cheaper. I think it's an inferior nutritional product quite honestly but you can do that eggs are, are are you know not that expensive although we don't want eggs to be the majority of the diet um you know you can go to these fast food places and order look see if you have patties i know i'll be in the uk i'll be in i'll be in heathrow airport you know day after tomorrow so i may go to whatever they have there and say and, and test it out and see if, it, if, if that's doable if they'll sell it to me that way because I, I, I find it are you are you passing through heathrow or are you coming out no, I'm, I'm passing. So I fly okay. uh, tomorrow. I fly. Well, I got to drive. I've got to drive to California tomorrow. Fly to France to, to Heathrow the next day, and then I take the, the I guess Eurostar over to northern France, and that's where I'll, I'll hook up with with some people that are, my my girlfriend's over there right now. And so okay. I'm going to spend uh, 10, 12 days over there, and then I'll come back to the U.S. and we can then I'll we can hopefully get the study rolling. But uh, but yeah, so I'm, so while I'm in Europe, I'll be you know I'll checking out what's going on in Europe because I know what's happening in the U.S. and I found you know I've been to about six or seven different fast food restaurants and every one of them has been willing to do that you know with rare exception there's been one or two that depending on the location said no we're going to charge you full price but, but but then I just go down the street and, and and do that so I think you can do that you just have to be mindful about it you have to buy in bulk sometimes if you got a freezer that's helpful yeah. you know sometimes if people buy just a big big giant uh, rib roast and they cut their own uh, you can. Uh, you know, like you said, buy a cow. I mean, there's people that buy if they've got the freezer capacity, they go in and go in and buy half a cow, and you can get half a cow is like 250 kilos of meat, and that'll last people many months typically. And so that's that's another way to do it on the cheap. And 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 if um, you're if you're buying something like frozen burgers, say, yeah. um, you know, from my perspective, I'm I'm guessing you're going to agree. Just make sure that it's pretty much 100 percent beef, right? Yeah, I mean, I th- yeah, I mean that's the thing. I mean, the, the, one of the knocks about a lot of the, some of these places they'll put filler, they'll put you know wheat gluten and yeah. soy protein in these burgers. Is you, you'd have your your beef ingredient should have one ingredient, yep. meat, you know, anything else in there you don't need. And so that's all stuff that I would avoid just in, for general reasons anyway. But but certainly for this, yeah, we we want to we want to make sure you have just just meat in your diet. Brilliant. Okay. So and then finally, I want I want to get I want people to get some perspective because. Previous to this, you were still training hard, exercising, you know, doing the stuff that you're doing using a carbohydrate-based diet. So it's not so, like it's not like you've just jumped into this and go, oh, look, all of a sudden I've started training and I'm great. But what's really interesting is that you've got a very good comparison between what you were doing before, what your body composition is, was, you know, your energy levels and this, that and the other, and how you feel now. So just briefly tell us through that because 
I think people will be looking at this and saying, oh, well, you know, if he's breaking world records now, if he starts some carbohydrate and he'd be even better. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I came from a, you know, a, a sort of a standard, what would be considered a relatively healthy diet of pasta, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, you know, and meat for, for most of my life, you know, uh, up until I was in my early forties and I was, I was a very high level athlete. You know, I was, I was able to weightlifting records and rugby and all that stuff and throwing. And then as my health deteriorated, I switched to a low calorie approach to lose some weight. Then I switched to a paleo, then, then, then a low carb then a ketogenic diet. And through all that time frame, I, while I was on a ketogenic diet, I, I experimented. I experimented with, you know, the targeted ketogenic diet, the cyclic ketogenic diet, the carb backloading, all those different strategies that are popular out, that, out there. And I, and I critically looked at my performance uh, and I didn't, I couldn't find a real significant improvement. I mean, it was, it was, you know, a tenth of a second here and there. And I'm looking, I'm, I'm talking about on the concept two rowing machine, which I think is a very good feedback mechanism because it just, it's always the same. It's always consistent. It's very objective. And then when I went on this carnivorous diet, I mean, my performance went up eight, nine, ten percent in, in a matter of a couple of months, which is when you're already pulling world records, that is a huge leap. It'd be like, you know, Usain Bolt knocking another three tenths off a three tenths of a second off his 100 meter time. Yeah. I mean, that's a big jump at that level. And so, uh, for me, it's you know, maybe it's you know, and I, I can talk about what's in meat. We know it's got a lot of protein. We know it's got a lot of animal protein, which we know is good for athletic performance. We know it has a lot of creatine. We know creatine has been established as a pretty good ergogenic aid. You know, it's got precursors for beta alanine, and it's probably got it's got iron for you know, it's got a lot of things in there. Heme iron. It's got a lot of things in there that we know supports performance and when i'm eating four or five pounds of it a day i think i'm, I'm in a i'm pretty well fueled for that stuff and so i think i was deficient in some of those things relatively now i could supplement with creatine and take beta alanine and you know sodium bicarbonate and all those other things uh you know the only thing i do i just take some caffeine still you know that's the only thing i tell people right. when they ask me about supplementation i'll take some caffeine pills uh prior to, to some workouts but but yeah i mean I, I've, I've tried the carbohydrate approach. I really have. And what it does to me is I didn't see a huge boost in performance, but what I did see is, and maybe because my gut microbiome has, has changed, is that gut symptoms came back and they were pretty bad. My joints started hurting, you know, and, and those mm -hmm. things make it hard to train. So yeah. when, you're, when you're a 50 year old guy, you don't have any joint pain. You can train a lot, a lot more efficiently than you can when you're gimping around with a sore knee or sore back and yeah, so yeah, absolutely. that's been my, that's that's why i think my performance is better one of the reasons on, on a total side note very quickly if you get patients coming in for the hip and knee replacement uh, which you do right i think it's knee yeah, knee and hip, right yeah um well yeah i've done hips knees shoulders i've replaced all of those yeah okay do you ever say to them try this this diet protocol first and let's see if things improve you know, it was kind of interesting because when I first, I think we talked about it in the first podcast, when I first started playing with diet, I had piece paces just needed to lose weight because they, they couldn't get a joint replacement until they lost the weight. And, and you know, I, I got tired of sending them to dietitians because they, one, their insurance wouldn't pay for it, and two, they never lost weight when they went there. And I started, I started putting people on low carb and ketogenic diets and noted that they, one, they lost weight, but two, they were saying their joints stopped hurting or, or, or significantly decreased. And we had a couple patients we just canceled surgery on because they were like, hey, <laughs> What's the point of replacing your knee if it doesn't hurt anymore? Even though there's still some arthritis in there, but if it doesn't hurt, there's no reason to replace it. You know, in most cases, if there's real bad deformity, then you still do it. But, but yeah, I saw that uh, for a number of different orthopedic conditions. You know, there's some people that come in there with rotator cuff pain. You know, and rotator cuff's not torn, but it's really irritated. And the, in, in my view, you know, if it's still attached, that's a perfect time for a dietary intervention. You know, sticking cortisone injections in there doesn't do anything long term it just kind of tamps down the inflammation temporarily whereas you know fixing their diet and getting rid of whatever whatever's causing that inflammation I, I do believe diet plays a large role in that there's some other things as well but i think diet is a huge factor probably the main factor and if you fix that and then all of a sudden a month later they say hey my shoulder's better i didn't need a shot i didn't need surgery i didn't need to go to physical therapy You've got some pretty happy patients, and I've definitely seen that. And I, and I and as I look as I lurk through social media, I mean, if you go on these zero zero carb Facebook groups, I mean, you see that all the time. People come in and they say, "Yeah, within a, within three weeks, my joints stopped hurt, stopped hurting." So yeah, I think that's that's a very it's not a money making deal. And I can tell you, that I, I'll tell you a little. Anecdote. I mean, I left my last employer because I was a, initially I was a huge high volume surgeon. I mean, I was 
you know, they, one of the administrators said he, I was a LeBron James of surgery because I was just I was just efficient and getting it done and, and taking care of a lot of patients. But when I stopped doing that and started saying, hey, I want a, I want a day of a, a day a week to, to do lifestyle counseling, the hospital they said no, we don't want you to do that. You know, that that, that just really was you know that just opened my eyes to, mm. to, to to modern healthcare. No, we don't want you to, you know counsel people on diet we're paying you to, 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 to make money for us and to operate our people and I I just couldn't I, I actually left that practice just for that reason it's interesting, so it's interesting when, a, when a, a top flight surgeon says listen before we start cutting you open let's see if we can change something you know from your diet perspective and see if that helps because you know a lot of people say if you go to a, a general doctor he's going to write want to write you a prescription you go to a, a surgeon he's going to want to cut you open you go to a nutritionist he's going to he's going to want to change your diet so it's really interesting to see that actually from your own perspective you know that things can be can be massively improved from that you know well, information it's, point it, it's yeah i mean it's hard once you see that demonstrated in diet it's impossible not to see that there's another orthopedic surgeon named gary fetke in australia who same same sort of thing he was demonized for telling diabetics to stop eating sugar I and mean, they literally told the, the the governing body they literally told them you can't say that which to me is ludicrous i mean mm. i can't imagine that but I mean, you know, once you see that and see that it works ethically, it's impossible. You know, I think if you're ethical, it's impossible not to sort of want to want to utilize that tool. And, and most doctors, we're just trained to, as a surgeon, I'm trained to cut on people, and I'm you know I'm trained to give people some prescriptions. I'm not trained in nutrition, so I don't, you know, we don't use that. Yeah. But it's a tool that works, and we should use that. And, and it's the onus is on us to get that training and to learn. I mean, I spent five years studying nutrition. And, you know, there's, there's a number of doctors that are starting to, to, to sort of catch on to this, and we're seeing more and more. I see that in social media all the time. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it's just not, we're just not set up for that stuff. And so when you step outside the box, it, 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 it impacts the bottom line, for one. And people don't yeah. like you to do that, unfortunately. And it's, it's at least worth giving it a go, because at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, fine. Cut them open and put a new knee in or, or shoulder, whatever it is, so without trying you, you just don't know okay so i don't want to keep you any longer because i know we've been longer than we thought we were going to be people are going to get involved all you've got to do is go to n equals many.com sign up get involved it's 90 days worst thing's going to happen is you're just not going to eat anything else for a little while and then you can go back to eating your pizza if that's what you want to do but it would be massively interesting to see what the results come out of. so um, and if you've got any other questions, uh, Sean's going to hate me for this, but if you have got questions for him, go to Twitter, look him up. You'll see him. If, uh, I, I can't remember what your, I think it's just Sean Baker, MD, right? It's just S Baker, MD. S Baker, MD. And, um, and, and you can inundate him with all sorts of madness. And you know what? He answers many of them. Every time I look through my feed, he's answered like 30 or 40 tweets on there. I don't know where you get the time from, but, um, Brilliant. Listen, mate. Any anything else you want to let people know before we before we wrap up? Yeah, just you know, just on the on the web page. So the web page is still under construction. I, I'm kind of putting it together myself, and I'm not a, I'm not a web guru in any means. So I'm still working on on getting that iron out. But but if you go on the page, there's a, there's a there's a there's a there's a post that says how do I sign up for the carnivore study, and then if you click on that, there'll be a video we ask you to watch. It's just me explaining the, the ins and outs of it. And then if you say yes, I want to do it, we'll ask you to send us an email at n equals many at gmail.com and, and we want the phrase I'm definitely in to be in the subject line just so when we sort through the emails we can see yes you're in and then we'll add you to the list and then we'll, we'll, we'll update you with emails additionally we're probably going to attach a fundraising site uh, or you know the thing to that so we can start to as we as we sort of publicize this and we get going we can raise funds as we're going so at the end hopefully we have uh, you know enough funding so we can really start to test a lot of stuff that people want to see people are interested in seeing so if you're interested to know if carnivory raises your C-reactive protein, you know, which I think is a very, very valid concern, you know, kick in a couple bucks and, and, and then we can maybe answer that question. So that's, I think that's, I think this crowd, crowdfunded research is going to be, I think that's going to be the way things are going to go. You know, I think the world's there, hopefully. Brilliant. Mate, thank you so much for coming on. Really interesting as always. And it, uh, whatever it is, 90 days after the end of the, uh, after the beginning of August, when you've got some results, I, I'm going to get you back on. I don't care whether you've got time or not. And I want to find out what's going on and what happened. And then we'll talk about it. 
Yeah, so, I, yeah, that'd be great. I mean, I think we'll put the data out there and, you know, and then people can sort of pick and choose through that and interpret that. We're not going to hide any of our data. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll, we'll keep it anonymous, but we're not going to hide any of that. And so we'll, you know, you know, there might be a massive amount of data. And so people can sort of sort through that and see how many are males and how many are females and how many are diabetics and how many were zero carb before. And then they can look at the different metrics. I think, and, and uh, of, I think Marty uh, Kendall will think his Christmas has, has come yeah. early once he gets hold of that because he will absolutely drill into it and uh, and bring some very interesting things out of it i'm sure um sean thank you so much have a great trip tomorrow um okay and um it's a shame you're not getting out at uh, at heathrow because we could have met up for a coffee but um maybe yeah. next time all right mate. Okay. take care see you soon take care paul cheers mate bye